Okay, so today we're very happy to have uh, Alejandra Castro uh, talking about mm -hmm. the spectrum of near extremal curve. Please, Alejandra. Very take good. Away. Um, Thank you, Jared. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, since I'm being recorded, I'll do my best to not say silly or stupid things. <laughs> so it's very self-conscious to <laughs> uh, being recorded. And, and I wanted to say uh, this talk is probably the closest to giving a talk while jet lag that I've experienced for a while. So it's kind of fun from that point of view. <laughs> I must <do> that. <laughs> So, okay, so let's, uh, let's get started uh, because uh, I only have an hour and I decided to do a version of like a Blackboard talk, also trying to reminisce it the good old days. So uh, let's go. So uh, this talk, uh, as the title uh, highlights, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, near extreme care. Uh, but uh, before I, I start, diving a little bit into the, the details and stuff. I, I just want to give a little bit the overview of in which angle I'm going to be looking at the spectrum of these near extremal black holes. And as this group in Stanford knows extremely, extremely well, because there's been uh, more than one contribution to this topic is the fact that uh, JT gravity, basically in this past, I don't know, four years, five years by now, uh, has been really central in our understanding of it near extremal black holes. And in particular, understand, I hope my spelling is not horrible. You, please do not criticize me. And in particular, understanding like quantum and holographic properties of these black holes. Um, and the basic question that uh, we've been studying, like at the at the core, is um, so in all these beautiful developments uh, and, and all these like nice features that we're coming to realize about uh, this two D uh, model. Um, I've been wanting to understand uh, where does this fit uh, in the context of a more like traditional subject, perhaps a more old fashioned uh, subject, but uh, how do I realize this, uh, these effects, the, this part of the description of black holes in the context of like the very well studied um, gravitational perturbations of black holes in general. So this subject is extremely, extremely old. I will not make it full justice, but there's big books. Uh, and in particular, I will care about 4D black holes uh, today. But like Chandra Sekar wrote a humongous book all devoted uh, to understanding um, the, the spectrum of, of black hole solutions. And, and one of the sort of dreams that, that I have is to kind of putting this new developments within that context. So what did relativists uh, missed back in the day? So what did they overlook? Uh, what did they do not take into account? Uh, why don't, do we see this physics in, that, in those studies or we don't, okay? And in which way? And so this has been um, a collaboration. It's a, it's a publication that will appear soon. We're writing a draft, uh, but nowadays I'm a slow researcher in any case. Um, so it's, a, it's work in progress um, that involves one of my former students, uh, Victor Godet, uh, Joan Simon, uh, Wei Song, and Bo Yang Yu, uh, who's a student of Wei and, and, and Xinhua. And I should mention, uh, Bo Yang is applying for postdocs at the moment. And in general, I do want to highlight uh, these two uh, young men that all of the difficult computations were done by, by them. So, and when you decide to study gravitational perturbations, uh, you have to be quite brave. Uh, it's, it's a bit, it can get a little bit tedious quite quickly. So, oops, sorry, um, So what I want to, um, 
So in this context, there's basically two features that I want to uh, highlight. Um, so as we study the gravitational perturbations, I'll reinforce this during the talk. Uh, but there's two like features that I would like to discuss. One, well, one will come just at the end. I it will not be so prominent in the middle. Uh, but basically, something that I've been uh, curious for more than too, way too many years by now um, is basically what is the imprint of these effects. Uh, so this near horizons effects on the UV, on the far regions of the black hole. So this is what I will colloquially call like gluing. Uh, I think it's an interesting thing to ask in the context of a lot of the astrophysical developments of black holes. Like if you dreamed one day to do holography on the sky, <laughs> it's sort of like, uh, and we are capable of like looking into near extremal rotating black holes. Uh, where should uh, this discussion fit? So that's, that's one aspect uh, of this program. But another one that I, I think for the holographers it's perhaps more interesting is that, and this I am going to make a big fuss about, is that there's new features due to rotation. Okay, so uh, a lot of the, the lore and the way things work are very much based on spherical symmetric black holes like the Rice and Ostrom solution. And it's not like, don't, don't worry, like <laughs> most of the, the lore will be there. So it's not like I'm going to like, like destroy any of the bridges or great developments, but there's new features coming in. And, and it's due to the fact that the black hole is rotating and it's not just electrically or magnetically charged. And from this aspect, I think that something interesting to look ahead is basically on what are the properties of those news effects, trying to interpret them in terms of a holographic setup, okay? Um, so this is very much, like sort of what I think is coming in the near future. And more universally, I like to kind of call this, this type of um, sort of agenda uh, as and, and, and trying to categorize these new features as basically a way of understanding uh, different universality classes in which black holes could fit in terms of like giving them a holographic uh, description. So black holes, of course, are very robust they share tons of features. They're not like, um, there's these loss of black hole mechanics. They're extremely like, um, yeah, elegant uh, beasts. But at the same time, they also have some differences, uh, which I would like to think of them as belonging to some universality class. So there's, there's one mechanism that is fundamental, but then there might be variety within uh, that mechanism. And I view it as a little bit as doing basically something like black hole chemistry, okay? So there's some building blocks, there's some concepts that are the common ground. And then it's sort of like, okay, what can you build uh, out of that? So that's, that's the basic idea. So now before I move on, uh, since I mentioned here uh, this thing, JT gravity, I'm not going to give a very, like, I'm not going to review this in full detail. Uh, it's a long subject, it's beautiful. It's filled with like really interesting corners. Uh, I'm just going to butcher the whole <laughs> field and just highlight um, precisely uh, what am I going to use in the talk and, and just to set up uh, some notation. But if it's not enough, if there's questions and you want to know uh, more, uh, please let me know. But uh, this is my two cents on what we're calling uh, JT gravity. Um, so here we go. So there's basically, um, yeah, just very, very few things that I want uh, uh, to either remind uh, or introduce uh, to you. So basically this is a theory, it's a, it's a 2D gravity theory coupled to a dilaton. Uh, the dilaton here, I'm going to be calling it capital phi and I'll denote it, I don't know why, I, I should just call it dilaton, but I find that has like a dimensional reduction type um, 
point of view. And so I'm just going to call it the JT field. So, okay, so in, the, in, the, in this context, it basically comes just because you have an action that looks like this. Um, but, okay. Uh, I want to think about it uh, uh, because in, in the cases where with rotation, it will have a slightly different flavor. So um, we're going to think of this as a field basically that from that two dimensional point of view uh, on ADS2 obeys this equation. So this is the equation, the JT equation. So it's a constraint, it's the fact that the stress tensor for this field is equal to zero. Um, and in the, in the language uh, of uh, ADS2 holography, uh, this field is basically something that has conformal dimension equal to two. Uh, from the dimensional reduction point of view, so in, in simple cases, uh, you should think of it like as the size of the sphere, uh, especially in the case of Reiser Nostrum, it is literally the size uh, of the sphere transfers uh, to the ADS2 portion of the near horizon. Uh, and the thing that it, it's one of the many impacts that it has had in, in, in black hole uh, physics, but uh, this is where it, it, it sh is showing up everywhere. It's basically the, the fact that it's responsible. So this field, uh, basically triggers the response away from extremality. And just to highlight one of its effects is basically if you look at the entropy of the black hole, it has an, an entropy at extremality. And then uh, the effects of this dilaton uh, combine uh, with the Schwarzschild mode that comes in the boundaries that it increases the temperature linearly with, uh, in this way. It's a linear response on the temperature, okay? Uh, so this is the main, like, from, from the point of view that I'm going to be thinking about this problem, this is one of the main effects, that uh, the JT sector is basically the sector that is describing the deviations away from extremality of black holes, okay? This is, this is the lore. Very good. So let's start putting this into play. Uh, in the context of the care solution. So here I wrote down the care solution. Um, I'm not going to write it. I wrote it beforehand because uh, I'm lazy and, and it takes a little while to, to write it, uh, but it's very familiar to, to all of you, I hope. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit of a nasty solution. So it's something that has intricate radial and angular dependence. Um, I didn't, it's not important exactly what are the values of these functions. I can tell you what they are, but um, it's, yeah. Uh, they are what they are. Though what's important here is that there's a blackening factor. So it's this function that uh, sits in GRR. And uh, so the black hole has a mass and it has an angular momentum. So J is equal to M times A in natural units. Uh, and the thing that we will care about is that when um, there's an extreme limit for the solution when M is equal to A, which I'll be calling uh, M naught, and an extremality, uh, you can take a decoupling limit of this, uh, of this background. Um, there's a nice paper by Bardeen and Horowitz uh, from uh, the early days of ADS CFT that show how to take this decoupling limit. And the resulting geometry in this decoupling limit, it's what it's called the near horizon of extreme care uh, neck. Okay. And the resulting geometry looks like this. Uh, so it shares many properties as the other black holes, uh, but the main feature, um, which we all like, uh, is that here there's the enhancements of symmetries, the fact that you get an ADS2 factor uh, in the geometry. And the effects of rotations is that there's, an, uh, there's a fiber here. So there's, there, there's an S1 direction that is basically fibered uh, with, the, with the ADS2. Okay, um, so very good. So this is the, uh, this is the, 
basically the situation, the, the core properties uh, of extreme neck and its near horizon solution. So if I, if I draw a, a small cartoon, uh, this, is my, <laughs> this is my cartoon of an uh, extremal black hole. Uh, so what this cartoon is depicting that is that if you're sitting very far away from the black hole, the, the space time is basically asymptotically uh, Minkowski, asymptotically flat. And as I take this decoupling limit that takes me close to the horizon, you develop this ADS2 throat. And so somewhere in here, like this throat is basically depicting this uh, neck part uh, of the geometry, okay? And uh, moving away from extremality, so as you, as you go away from this, uh, from this limit, uh, this, the throat starts to disappear. You break basically the symmetries of ADS2. And basically we want to uh, explore that. So how do you sort of um, basically uh, destroy the symmetries that you get here? So that will lift, will turn on uh, the temperature and it will eventually basically glue you to the fact that you came from a region that was asymptotically uh, flat. So as we move ahead, the task yeah. ahead is roughly twofold. So we're going to do two things, sort of intertwined, okay? So one thing that we're going to be thinking about is that uh, based on this decoupling limit, so in some sense, if you reverse the, the decoupling limit, if you don't go that close to the near horizon, it sort of tells you like, okay, so what like what is the deviation away from, from extremality? It's, it's encoded uh, in, in, in this limit if you don't take uh, lambda uh, strictly to zero. So one thing that will guide our intuition uh, is that based on this decoupling limit, uh, what we'll be looking at is how to characterize, how to decode Basically, the, as you move away from the throat, how do you decode, uh, decode uh, the squashing and size of the sphere of the, the way that you will, uh, sorry, uh, squashing or size of the S2 that basically indicates to you, okay, how would you move away uh, from, from extremality? Okay, uh, so that's one effect that we want to uh, keep in mind. And then uh, the thing that will be more prominent in the next uh, pages is that I want to place this into context of the known gravitational uh, perturbations. Okay, very good. So let's do that. Let's start talking about the gravitational perturbations. So let's go back to the 70s, the 80s, your favorite year, your favorite author. I put here a reference. Um, it, th these are some very nice lecture notes uh, by Jeffrey Compare. If you're not familiar with uh, these, these names. Uh, NP here stands for um, Newman Penrose uh, formalism. Uh, if you have never heard of Mr. Tolkowski, uh, but you don't want to be intimidated by the Bible that Chandrasekhar wrote. Uh, Geoffrey has like some very nice notes. He discusses many subjects, but one of the chapters is like a review on how you treat uh, gravitational perturbations. So um, I don't know. You can look at that, but there's tons Laundry, of papers. Sorry, can I ask a naive question? Yes. So uh, unlike many people here, I'm not an expert on JT gravity. Um, I remember many years ago, there was a discussion of, of near extremal occur holography, and there was a debate about whether when you get the throat geometry, excitations really can be treated in the holographic theory of the throat because back reaction has a large effect. And so it's not really true that you can add a particle. Now, presumably the recent story dovetails with that in some way and clarifies it. Is that already known? Is that what you're telling us now? Uh, yeah, so that, that's basically what happened, yeah, up here. So 
Um, so in the context of care CFT, for instance, uh, so that's, that's probably what you were referring to like back in the day. Um, those boundary conditions, if you want, when they were trying to characterize the face space and what were the possible ex excitations, they were preserving the ADS too. They were looking at perturbations that did not destroy the SL2 symmetry. Okay, and if you preserve the uh, ADS2 symmetry, then uh, there you can't have finite energy excitations. Uh, it's just impossible. So from that context, if I just make that comparison, uh, that's a different. Uh, we're setting a different set of boundary conditions, and the new boundary conditions uh, that this new developments uh, have taught us is that this field. So, so that's why I was also highlighting the fact here that delta was equal to two. So this is an irrelevant deformation. Uh, it's breaking the symmetry explicitly uh, and, and therefore it's adding energy like sort of. Uh, but the nice thing is that it does it in a way uh, that does not depend on the UV cutoff. So what people might have feared in the bat and back in the day that this might have depended on how you set up a cutoff on the theory because you're adding some uh, irrelevant perturbation. But the way that this field talks to the ADS2 part of the geometry combines into this Schwarzschild effective action. And, and this, this parameter C here depends uh, basically on the source that you put uh, for phi, but um, so you have to make it so small so that the, because that's, that's an irrelevant perturbation, you can't make it uh, too big, but it gives you a universal accounting to this linear response. Uh, so that's, that's very, that was very surprising to me that you could. Okay, thank you. That, that, that's clear. So, so, so the takeaway is if there's any UV completion that it'll share this universal feature right. for this small set of perturbations yeah. of the infrared. And I want to see how that happens in care. Like, uh, so you. this is how ha it happens in, in rice and ostrom, let's say. And I want to know, okay, is, is this something, like if you just do thermodynamics of care and of most black holes that I know of, just dimensional analysis will tell you that the response is linear in temperature. Uh, but it's basically, yeah. So we'll, we'll see what comes in different uh, in, in, this, in this context. Okay, so very good. So here we are. Um, so gravitational perturbation. So how did uh, how did people think about uh, understanding uh, basically uh, the spectrum of black holes uh, back in the day? So what I'll talk about today. Uh, uh, well, our, our project does focus on the entire uh, care geometry, but uh, for simplicity, I'm only going to focus on how to analyze the spectrum. Uh, basically, uh, just for, for the near horizon of NEC, because it's a little bit cleaner, you have more symmetries, so it's, it's nicer to, to study. Uh, I'm also going to, this effect of moving away from extremality does not really, it's not going to rely on excitations that will have a quantum number in this direction, so I'm also going to focus on perturbations that are independent of the angle, okay? So these will be like the two simplifications uh, for today. Now, the way that usually in this, uh, so one of the nice things that Tilkowski did uh, in, in his famous uh, papers is that uh, he basically, um, well, there were, it was kind of known that the nice way how to characterize uh, the degrees of freedom uh, of the metric uh, was to basically build uh, these vial scalars. So, there's, um, there's five of them, five complex variables indicating to you that there's 10 independent components uh, of the bioscalar in four dimensions. Uh, and you build a basis of uh, tetrads uh, that are these vectors M, N, and L uh, that are null on the care geometry and contractions of these tetrads with the vowel tensors basically give rise to these scalars. I'm highlighting uh, only two of them the one that people call zero and four, uh, because basically Tokoski showed how to decouple those two uh, degrees of freedom and build a master equation uh, for the, just those two. So the highlight of these two, so as you study linearized perturbations in terms of these variables, is that one is that uh, at the linear level, they're both gauge invariant, so invariant under uh, a lead derivative of the metric and also tetrad 
invariant. So there are good variables to, to describe the perturbations. And then the second thing is that basically there's this Tilkowski uh, master equation that it's a second order differential equation. It looks like a klein gordon equation. It's basically a klein gordon equation for a spin two field. Uh, but that, that's the nice thing that he basically showed how uh, actually there's just a very simple um, equation for each of these two uh, perturbations. Okay, uh, and so in this language, so what happens? So what are the possibilities? Uh, here I'm describing, to be quite honest, the focus is always on the full care geometry, not just on neck. So a lot of the theorems and big statements that are made are for the whole geometry. And one has to be a little bit careful that neck, because it has enhanced symmetries, it doesn't always have to comply uh, to that lore. But uh, this is basically the result uh, of Wald uh, from the 70s that he basically showed uh, that you can, in this formalism of understanding gravitational perturbations in terms of this bioscalers, there's basically four options, okay? Uh, so you can have uh, basically gravitational waves. Uh, so these will be the excitations for which this psi four is different from zero and psi zero is different from zero. And he basically also, well, it was clear also from the Tchaikovsky formalism, but if you know one, you know the other. So you don't have to even keep track of both of them, okay? So there's just basically one variable, you solve for that one, and then you, you have it all, okay? Uh, you can also uh, discuss other type of, of situations. So you can also dis discuss like, oh, what are the perturbations that just change the mass and the angular momentum of the solution? Uh, what are perturbations that, for instance, just are diffeomorphisms? So this will be the ones that the relativists will consider very boring. Uh, and these ones, in the context of the full care geometry, uh, will show that uh, the two vial scalars are identically zero, okay? So this is for the entire geometry for care. And then there's also another thing that you can do, which is add uh, nut charge or add acceleration, which will give rise to something that is called like a C metric. Uh, so that's also a fourth option that um, we could discuss, okay? So this is usually, <laughs> this is the classical, the traditional way uh, of describing these things. But okay, but uh, this, we want to make contact with like the point here is that I want to make contact with this discussion, okay? So I want to make contact with how uh, these people uh, basically described the perturbations of a black hole. But at the same time, as I kind of advocated a bit above here, I also want to have this interpretation of like what, how am I affecting the geometry? How am I changing like scales uh, on it? So uh, what we're going to do uh, is that instead of using directly the Tolkowski variables, I'm going to make, you can ask me, Maybe later, how did we come about uh, with this guess? But it's, it's basically coming from the decoupling limit. Uh, but let's basically encode. So our, what our work is showing is basically how to encode the information of these, uh, of these scalars of psi zero and psi four in the metric directly, okay? Uh, because something that people in the relativist community do stress out a lot, and there's like way too many papers on this, is basically, okay, so you solve things for these vital scalars, but then doing metric reconstruction, it's not nice. And there's even papers like, uh, this is still a subject that um, is quite discussed a lot. But okay, let's, let's uh, so we, we could make some very nice guesses about what was going on. So let's make the first round of this discussion and let me write it as follows. So I want you to consider, so, so this is the neck geometry that we had above. And so what we're going to do is that we're just going to modify it in certain places with some hindsight, okay? So I'm modifying it there and there. So every time I saw like that cosine squared of theta, uh, I put a little variable chi and I also need to modify here the gauge field. And 
So I'm doing uh, that modification. That's how I'm going to be describing the gravitational perturbations. And this field chi is something that depends on, so this subscript X, sorry, sub A of theta. Um, so this basically depicts, so remember this was the ADS2 part. Uh, and so here, these are the ADS2 coordinates there. I'm basically depicting that it can depend on R and T. And uh, at this stage also, it can be just, uh, it's also a function of theta, okay? Uh, so this will be the main variable to characterize for the perturbations and consistency with the Einstein's equations basically show uh, that this, this other part that I, this like kind of gauge field that I added here, uh, it's just a function of chi, okay? Up to some trivial uh, diffeomorphisms, okay? So it's just determined, I'm writing it for completeness because otherwise the answer is not consistent, but it's just determined by chi, okay? Now, so how do we relate this to psi zero and psi four? So why was this a nice thing to do? So the relation to the vial scalars, and this you can, it's straightforward to compute. Once you have a metric, you just compute its vial scalars and contract it with the appropriate tetrads. And this is where you get a really nice uh, relationship between these variables. because I have to write more then I become kind of quiet. Okay, so let me write both of them because they're pretty simple. So they're in this form, these covariant derivatives are covariant derivatives with respect to ADS2. L and N are ADS2 null vectors. They're basically the projections of the ones that I wrote above, but for uh, just the ADS2 part uh, of the geometry. And yeah, and this is the, the, this is the relationship between these two variables. And so uh, the reason why, like, well, there will be more than one reason why it's nice to write this. Uh, but it's kind of, um, um, as we will see, this variable here will just uh, satisfy, it, it looks like just a scalar, well, it's just a scalar function. And so as we will decode it, it will just satisfy some like Klein-Gordon equation. And these are spin two variables. And of course they have to be related by two derivatives with respect to chi, that's all, okay? So if this was spin zero, then this is spin two, then that's all that is happening, okay? Uh, but this will also illustrate, so what these relationships also show us is that uh, it basically, and it, it becomes, it will be more clear perhaps in a moment, but uh, all the solutions to the Tilkowski equations that are at least independent of phi, I can encode them via this variable, okay? So any solution that was non-trivial from the point of view of this definition will be encoded uh, in, inside of this field. Okay, so I'm trading the information here by the information here. Okay, and it has this nice sort of like position inside of the metric. Okay, very good. So now uh, let's start doing a bit the dynamics. So what are the equations of motions for this guy? So the linear equations of motion. Uh, you can either do it by the Tilkowski master equation, or you can just plug this in into the Einstein's equations as you wish. Okay, so what happens is the following. This field chi, uh, what becomes natural is to decompose it in this following way because there's a sine squared down here. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be multiplying it, but, I, but that sine squared. And then I'll do a separation of variables with respect to the angular part and the ADS2 part. Okay, so this part over here is just a spheroidal harmonic from your favorite, my favorite reference is Abramowitz. So 
It's one of those nice special functions. Uh, so, so that's just a special function on the sphere. It's basically, it's going to be a Legendre polynomial in a second. Um, and this other part that only depends on the ADS2, uh, as expected, just satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation on ADS2, okay? Where the eigenvalue is this parameter K that I'm denoting here, okay? So this is just the wave equation on ADS2. Okay, and from here you can read off what the conformal dimensions of these fields are. So the two roots that you get, so it's a massive field. And this is the answer, okay? And there's a BF bound uh, for uh, the minimum value of K. Okay, very good. So that's what you get. Now, so let's now make the comparison uh, a bit more in detail with the spectrum uh, of gravitational perturbation. So what would these guys call gravitational waves? Uh, so if you go and look in any of this uh, references, the first thing they do, they will do the same steps as we're doing here. They will do separation of variables uh, because the equations become uh, separable, so why not? Uh, but the number one thing that they impose because they're reasonable people, not like me, uh, is that they would say, look, these functions over here have to satisfy a stern reveal problem. Basically, they have to be well-defined on the sphere. Uh, they have to be single-valued. Uh, they shouldn't have any poles or singularities. And that puts a restriction on what those functions are. Okay, uh, so uh, these guys should satisfy and review problem and basically it, it just tells you that these functions are associated uh, Legendre functions and as such as based on the wave equation that they satisfy this k uh, it's easier to write it it's nicer to write it as l times l plus one and l is just an integer that starts at two Okay, and just to be clear, uh, also to highlight the conformal dimension, the delta plus here will just be uh, L plus one in this notation. Okay, so it's a number that it's already bigger than three. So your favorite part of the spectrum, if you open Chandra Sekhar's book, falls into that category. From in the language of the ADS2 fields, there are uh, perturbations that have a conformal dimension bigger than three. And that's what they are. I'm leaving a little bit of suspense, but <laughs> it's because I've been talking too much. I get tired, okay. Uh, but of course you would say, but okay, uh, from this point of view in this language, uh, so, and this is why I was mentioning this JT part of the spectrum before, uh, we were kind of looking for something that had conformal dimension two. This looks like a little bit too irrelevant. Um, so any part, uh, like basically it all comes, it all boils down on the fact that you require these modes uh, to be single valued. And then the entire spectrum is just a bit way too high, a bit too uh, energetic. Um, and, and it covers every single solution uh, that it's independent of the angle phi. So yeah, there's, there's no JT gravity in this part. But of course, uh, looking at this equation, uh, there's nothing, well, there will be something preventing me, but um, you might ask, uh, why this nice lady is not doing the following. So let's start discussing the JT sector, uh, round one. Uh, and basically, 
And from this analysis, you would tell me, okay, by the supernatural, what you have to do, just pick k equal to two, and this will give you in this language that you're using a field that will have conformal dimension equal to two, which is true. Uh, and so, yeah, so you, you have at the level of this Klein Gordon equation, you have chi of two is equal to two times chi two. Uh, if you look at the angular part and you ask yourself why the relativist hated uh, this uh, solution, it's because of the following. Uh, it basically has, well, yeah, I'll write both of them. There's two linearly independent solutions to the angular part when you put k equal to two as expected. It's a second order differential equation. Uh, and this thing has poles. Hey, at theta equal to either zero or pi. So of course, Mr. Tolkowski would not have considered this as a interesting solution. Now, uh, but I'm still stubborn. So let's keep on uh, hammering on this. And so let me copy this file scalar. So, okay, fine. The angular functions are, um, are blowing up and that's why they don't like them. Sure, it's okay. Uh, so, well, but one thing that I could do just to not completely, so of course, an easy way out of this problem will say, okay, just turn off, like just set chi equal to zero, forget about this mode because uh, clearly it doesn't, it's, uh, uh, it doesn't have the support that uh, the nice regular support that you expect out of a perturbation. Uh, so let's throw it away, please. Uh, but you could do something a little bit milder without necessarily putting chi equal to zero. Uh, you could just say, okay, let me impose that these differential uh, equations here are zero. Okay, say that those two conditions uh, are equal to zero. And the nice thing that happens in this context, so if I call this equation, the Klein-Gordon equation one, and the combination of these two equations, equations two, uh, one thing if you spell out what these things are is that one plus two, uh, the combination of these three conditions uh, basically are the JT equations of motion. Okay. So, um, so in this sense, you're like, wow, this is super nice. So the condition for the file scalars to be zero um, gave you uh, the same uh, equations of motions as the, this capital field phi uh, equations, okay? And you're like, hooray, you got it. Uh, are we done now? Unfortunately, we're not done. Um, so, okay, so there's, 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 there's some, there's some, <laughs> there's more to say. There's more to say. Uh, and I'm running short of time. So let's say what I need to say. So what do I need to say? Uh, the first thing uh, to note, because based on the type of perturbations that I could have, so I told you all, oh, you can have gravitational waves, you can have changes of mass and angular momentum, you can have diffuse. Uh, and stuff like that. Uh, do note that imposing these restrictions, uh, so the fact that I imposed one plus two uh, does not imply that chi is a diff. And you can check that explicitly. So this field, even though it's vial scalars on neck are zero, uh, does not imply that chi is a diffeomorphism, okay? So it doesn't fall into that classification uh, of Walt. It is just simply not a diff, okay? Although, These two guys are zero. Uh, the other thing that I want to highlight, so sorry, I'm going to again to not write down this line element. Be useful to keep staring at it. Um, there's one very important problem. Uh, and the, the one is that, okay, so I impose those restrictions, uh, that restriction two, such that 
the fact that this was not single value didn't, um, not, I'm sorry, not single, that it didn't have a pole was not bothersome. Uh, but the second problem here is that this geometry uh, is still actually ill-defined. <laughs> so if I put in the value for k equal to two, when I see what is the effect uh, near, uh, for instance, theta equal to zero. So if you just zoom in near one of the poles um, of, the, of the sphere, uh, you get the following. So basically you get a conical singularity in the geometry, although the vial scalars are trivial. So here the dot, dot, dots are things that I'm ignoring that are not important to highlight the fact that you have a, a cone. Um, so yeah, so, so this geometry is a bit uh, sick, so this is single. And the third issue is that from my intuition that what the JT field was supposed to do was to change the size of the horizon, <laughs> to change the determinant uh, of the two sphere. Uh, you can see from this answer that if I compute the determinant of the two sphere, uh, chi basically cancels off. So this field chi has no effect uh, on the size of the sphere. Chi does not. So if you forget the fact that I actually am introducing a cone, but if you if you only cared in your life for some reason about determinants, uh, you will notice that this chi does not affect uh, the determinant of the S2 part. Okay, uh, so it, if I computed the area of the horizon, you wouldn't see any change uh, because of this thing. Okay, so there's something missing. Um, and the, the way, and this is where the story doesn't end. So uh, again, a relativist will have told me, please lady, turn off that field because it seems like it's full of it. So, but okay, we'll keep on hammering on it. I have a nail and so why not hammer it? And, and so let's do the round two. Okay, the second half. And I promise to be very close to being done after this uh, second half. Um, I know I go a bit slower because I'm right. Okay, whatever, fine. Okay, so what is the second half of this story? Okay, so we, we do want, uh, I do want my JT uh, description. So what we're going to do, okay, so we're going to take a little bit of a step back, not too back, but just, just to illustrate, I don't want to write everything at the same time because then it becomes a bit clever. So, so let me. Let me delete that thing for Kai and I'll, I'll write this one again. Why not? Okay. Uh, so what we're going to do now is basically say, okay, so let's now just think about I do think. Um, let's just think now uh, about an ansatz for the perturbations. Uh, such that you're really changing the size of the sphere of this so solution. Uh, okay. And now the nice thing about this, so you can you can do this uh, in this solution. And so now, for instance, if I want to do it very explicitly, I would do it like I would put, for instance, something there. Uh, I'm not going to tamper with the size of the theta. Uh, here, also for consistency, you have to add some like some stuff here that I'm not going to be paying too much attention to. It's just also for consistency of the assets. And there's also a gauge field here, which is also for consistency of the assets. Uh, but basically I can now uh, look at perturbations. Um, so all of this is treated as a linearized uh, solution. Uh, and here, uh, this, this capital field phi, you can guess I'm using the notation. It looks like the JT field. It is also something that only depends on the RT uh, components and it's like some small deformation. I'm introducing it in a way that it looks like I'm, I'm deforming the size of the S2. 
Okay. Now, the thing that is really interesting about this case is that now I'm not going to do the Tolkowski thing again. Don't worry. Okay. So if you didn't like the Vyob scalars and you thought that they were nasty, horrible variables, don't worry. They, they will not show up again because actually an ansatz like this, uh, you can construct by just doing a diffeomorphism. Um, you don't, we don't need to do anything dynamic. So just consider, um, so you can generate this. The following diff. And so you, the only thing that you have to do is that you have to be bold, like the students that were working with us in our project, <laughs> and consider the formorphisms that are linear in the angle. So they're non single value diffeomorphisms, things that why would you have ever considered this? Uh, but this is a beautiful diffeomorphism that has legs on the T and R components. Like this, there's also a part that doesn't depend on the angle. Um, but this deformorphism will do the trick of reproducing basically uh, this line element. And the thing that is interesting in this context, the JT equation shows up because as you start doing this diff, so basically like, the way that you have to look at this diffeomorphism is that there's a part here that uh, has something linear in phi in the phi direction, multiply by phi. That's going to basically augment this, this uh, component of the metric. That's what this part is doing. Uh, but then you don't want to have linear dependence on the angle as you go along because then the metric itself will be non-single valued. And so the JT equation shows up because you want this, the lead derivative, the resulting lead derivative along this direction to not depend on phi. And so the JT equations basically appear as a condition. So the JT equations of motions now, of course, for this phi appear as a condition on the resulting on and this thing to not depend on the azimuthal angle, phi. Okay? And there's no need to use any equation of motion, no dynamic, like it just shows up, okay? Uh, now, the other thing that is nice about uh, realizing the JT sector in this way is that now, uh, if I consider both phi and chi. Um, all of my dreams are going to come true. So now I, I bring together both of these things that had satisfying the JT equation. And the thing that is nice is that now if I look again at my, at my line element near theta equal to zero, Uh, this happens. And so uh, if I only have one of the fields, I am going to generate a conical defect. Okay, so you're going to put a singularity either at zero or pi, pick whatever position you want, doesn't matter, but you're going to have a defect. But if you have both of them, both of these effects turn on at the same time, you can of course tune them so you can just tell me, look, you're going to solve all of your problems if you put chi equal to phi, and then there's no pull. And that's really nice. So that's the first time I see this happening in this way. So it's a combination uh, of two things at the same time. So let's write that up and I'm very close to Okay, I think I'm, I'll be reasonable in time. I'm getting close to the end. So, so what is the summary up to now is that the JT sector 
Uh, right, for care and care on care. I don't know how to use prepositions anymore. Okay, it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, the JP sector uh, for care uh, is composed by two effects. None of them by themselves will do the trick. Uh, but the first effect is basically, oh, well, sorry, the, it was the second one that I discussed, is this non-single valued uh, diff by this beautiful variable phi that I was just talking about before. Uh, and the second effect is basically this mode, which I set up to have trivial values of these bioscalers with k equal to two that I was calling uh, chi. Alejandro, let me ask another naive question. So um, I understand what you're saying here, but a, a question that, that all sort of bothered me is, You've now told us there's this tower of chi k's with k equal three, four, five, and so forth. Yeah. Is there a consistent truncation that just includes the JT mode? Or if not, why are we ever talking about JT gravity alone without the full tower? Uh, they're more massive. Um, well, there's no, there's no parametric gap. So unless there's a consistent truncation, there's no guarantee about solutions, right? It's literally the same as the situation with the sphere and ADS CFT with ADS five. Sure, yeah. Um, it's just that, um, yeah, so in prison, of course, yes. So all of these, because they're all controlled by, their masses are controlled by the ADS2 uh, size. So I do think it's a good question because I do like to think about how these things interact uh, with each other. But at the level, at, the, at this linearized level, uh, the other modes will not contribute, for instance, to the entropy or the free energy. So they don't contribute to the thermodynamics like that. You can see. Okay. Yeah. So just to keep it uh, simple. So, um, but uh, understanding how they like they interact. Or for instance, like the stuff that. Um, so this is, there's this very nice papers by uh, Luca, who's in the group in Stanford uh, with uh, Joaquin. Uh, that if you wanted to, for instance, understand quantum uh, corrections and, uh, and computing one loop determinants, then you have to include the, you, you have to know what the rest of the tower is doing. So you sum over all the, uh, over all the KK spectrum. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, now some small observations that I want to make. I no, what happened? Sorry. And this is related a bit to what uh, Shamit was asking. Uh, so number one uh, is that, yeah, so you might have looked like, so in some sense, because of how phi entered in the ansatz relative to chi, it kind of looked like, um, if, if you wouldn't have noticed that you had a conical singularity, you might have been tempted to like, sorry that I'm scrolling up here, but you might have been tempting to end the discussion here have realized at some point that this was just a large diffeomorphism. And if you compute the area of the horizon, you would have declared victory. Uh, you would have said, oh, okay, phi is basically the dominating effect in terms of just saying, okay, so what is the, if I compute the Bekenstein Hawking entropy, it's just the area of the horizon divided by four. So just because of how it enters uh, in the line element, okay? So this is not too profound. Uh, now, but one thing though, that here's where you actually, you have to be more careful about this, this stuff. Uh, so if you actually compute IR wall charges, so you actually tell me, okay, how much energy do each of these like perturbations add to the geometry? Well, the first of things is that 
If you try to compute our wall charges, so the gravitational charges associated to these perturbations, if you have a cone, uh, <laughs> then you, you can't go through the procedure like in a normal way because uh, you can't just tell me that it's an integral over a surface because you actually have a singularity sticking there in the middle. Uh, so you, you, need, you do need to remove it. Uh, and both, uh, so in this geometry that is smooth, that includes both of these fields, you can see that both of them contribute to the total energy. So it's, it's not that one of them, it's just up here for cosmetics. Um, so when we say that the energy of the solution, so you had some extremal energy that augmented by some, by some heat capacity times T squared, uh, both of these fields are playing a role. It's not just one of them. Uh, and both of them contribute. Uh, you need both of them to make a consistent uh, computation. Now, I also want to kind of um, make some general observations here. So I know in this talk, I've been referring a lot to uh, just the care solution. And I was quite specific about how things exactly like worked out on care. Uh, but this diffeomorphism actually, and, and it's basically the same one in, in any number of dimensions. Uh, but this trick that we pull out here of like trying to build the Schwarzschild by doing a large uh, non-single value diffeomorphism will work for any rotating black hole. It's not special to, to care. So anytime that you have angular momentum, uh, you can induce uh, this change on the size of the sphere. Uh, by doing a diffeomorphism of this way. And basically the appearance of the JT equations of motions are going to come again as a restriction on the fact that the resulting line that I'll mention in the pen on phi. So this, uh, okay, I haven't like really proven it, but this is just my experimental <laughs> observations for my favorite uh, rotating black holes. So, um, so for rotating black holes, and this includes the BTC, Uh, you can induce the chain and uh, induce this change in the area of the horizon by the same mechanism. And what's nice about noticing this uh, is that uh, at least for rotating black holes, it puts, them, it puts this part, this sector, in a very universal and, and prominent way where I don't have to rely on equations of motions or the details of the dynamics of the systems. Like, because it's, ju it's just a diffeomorphism that you're doing. And so if you want to kind of account for, for, for like the existence uh, of this JT field, uh, you can do it quite robustly. Uh, in this way, depending on how the rotation is included. Uh, so uh, of course here, this for care, this wasn't enough, uh, but uh, you, you, you will have to include other things. But um, it's, I, I find it uh, interesting in the context of like, also moving away a bit on the interpretation, um, like on the reliance on this that depends so much on, on JT itself as the, as, as the details of like this 2D theory of, of gravity, because in some sense, the area of the black hole um, only in two derivative theories of gravity depends on the area of the horizon, but you might want a, a mechanism of understanding how this works. If you have the walled entropy, if you have like more general situations, like I don't think this is just special to the fact that you were doing einstein hilbert gravity. Uh, it feels more robust. And so it shouldn't rely so much uh, on which specific action uh, you're using. Also the arguments that come from why this has to be the way of thinking of it from the point of view of SYK, it, it, it feels like you shouldn't be relying so much on, on details of the gravitational theory. So the fact that at least for rotating black holes, you can describe it without the, um, this uh, part it's nice. And the fourth thing um, 
to comment uh, on is that uh, for rotating black holes, though, uh, as is illustrated in this box, they always come accompanied, <laughs> at least at the minimum. Okay, as, as Shamit was saying, there's always like a whole tower uh, of, of modes. Um, but uh, at the minimum level, they like this field phi always likes to talk to, <laughs> to another one. Uh, you, you have to basically diagonalize uh, the, the, the spectrum. This depends a bit on the dimensionality and how rotation comes in. But uh, so depending a little bit on the details, but then 10. Right, so depending on some details of the rotation, but um, and I always wants to like, the, the thing that I've noticed is that there's always an interplay between two fields, like they're, they're kind of battling each other in some way. One is this phi that kind of describes the size of the black hole. And I usually call chi the other one that describes like a squashing uh, of the sphere, okay? Uh, the, the details depend on like the conformal dimension of this guy is not always necessarily two. So for instance, in, in five dimensions, uh, the conformal dimension of the squashing mode is between two and three. So it, it plays a, a slightly uh, different role. Uh, but in any case, um, yeah. This is kind of fun. For Verizon Nostrum, all the other ones are kind of at, the, at this linearized level, they're sort of decoupled and they don't talk too much. They talk in a very boring way with phi. Okay, very good. So to start ending, I think I left the page blank because I thought I was going to write more. So <laughs> let's go down here. Uh, so let me start. Yeah, I'm five minutes over, my apologies. Um, yeah, so a bit of discussion, uh, how much time, when, Jorit? Um... Oh, yeah, you can go on for like five more minutes or something, 10 okay. more minutes, that's, that's okay. Be, okay, yeah. just in, otherwise I was just going to leave this uh, <laughs> as that. No, okay. please, please okay. go ahead. Um, so, uh, in the discussion, I wanted to sort of mostly just highlight some, some other things that we are thinking about and reasons why <laughs> this paper is to appear and that has not appeared yet. And it's because of this, uh, this issue of like trying to understand if you're, how do you actually like relate this mode here to basically a mode that is far in the UV. Now, in the context of the Rysonostrum black hole, so anytime that you have uh, spherical symmetry, uh, at least, well, okay, let me just say it in four dimensions because I don't want to make generalizations. Birkhoff's theorem works differently in, depending on the number of, uh, of dimensions. But in, in the simplest case, that is just the Rysonostrum solution, Einstein Maxwell theory, spherical symmetry, you have this beautiful thing called Birkhoff's theorem. Uh, which basically tells you that it, is that if you have spherical symmetry, uh, there's no gravitational waves. <laughs> so uh, from the point of view of outside, this is another reason why a relativist would not have even considered studying uh, the subject in terms of like a sort of perturbations that preserve the size of the sphere because uh, everything is a diffeomorphism plus a change of mass or charge. Uh, and it's true, it's a true statement. Uh, so this basically tells me that from the point of view of outside of the near horizon, everything is a diffeomorphism uh, plus a change of mass or Q. That's, that's all the perturbations that preserve the size of the S2. Sorry, the shape of the S2, not the size, the shape. Now, uh, in this context, the JT field uh, then just gets glued to that and you can, you can build it uh, quite explicitly. So it's not a diffeomorphism, again, in the near horizon geometry of the Ray's and Ostrom solution, but it does get glued to a diffeomorphism plus a change of mass and angular moment. Now, in the case of care, uh, there's no such uh, Birkhoff's theorem. You can't have gravitational waves. Um, 
in, in this case, you, know, you don't have spherical symmetry. And uh, one thing that we have uh, showed, uh, although I don't write it in talks yet because it's kind of nasty, is that if we're in this case where the, where the perturbations uh, were supported in a regular way, they did not induce a conical singularity, you can also show that this is a diff plus a change of mass. Um, this is what we have so far. But one of the things that we've been trying to understand um, is how to think about these modes basically independently. Uh, because yeah, there's a regularity condition that tied them, uh, but in some sense, you could also talk about them uh, separately. So what is basically the language or the way that I could uh, think about each of these uh, modes uh, without setting them equal to each other. But if you do set them equal to each other, uh, then they do become a uh, diffeomorphism plus a change of mass outside. The other thing that I wanted to discuss or mention, um, and it's, it's tied to this issue that uh, the JT field in general does discuss and talk to the matter fields. Um, in care, it's a little bit difficult because like going beyond the linearized level, it becomes kind of cumbersome, uh, but uh, there are other black holes, in particular black holes in five dimensions uh, for which you have much more control uh, on understanding what are these interactions, uh, how do you characterize the spectrum, how do they affect uh, various things. So the diloton, uh, so the, sorry, this JT field, the, there's uh, other modes uh, on the sphere and this JT field is not just like, it is coupled uh, to, 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 this, to these other fields. And so it's from my point of view of understanding the chemistry and like what are different things that happen as you understand what is the spectrum uh, of this black hole. And I consider this example quite nice. And so this is some work um, in collaboration with Juan, Chiara, and, and Evita. Chiara and Evita are both in the group in Amsterdam. And then just to rent a little bit. Uh, so these are other directions um, that besides like the obvious, so the, there's the obvious things here also of like just understanding how an SYK like model will be modified, understanding holographic properties, blah, blah, blah. So, so that, that all goes in uh, a bit implicitly. Um, but other things that I, I consider um, eh, quite eh, interesting, perhaps less eh, obvious, um, are the following. So one is something that I was mentioning during the talk. Uh, I, I think it's quite useful to try to think about uh, this effects in a more, in a way that it's more suitable to the Iron world formalism and try to um, understand how to argue or if in which way do they persist this effects under the inclusion of higher derivative corrections. For instance, the the, um, the heat capacity gets affected by higher derivative terms, the value of it. It's not insensitive to one of our end corrections. So it's, it's, you can read it off from the area there will be a value, but then if you add higher derivative terms to your theory, that value gets changed. So that's just one thing to point out. And I think there's ways how to, how to do this. Uh, so it's something that we've been uh, thinking about. Uh, the other thing, and this is also one reason why I think that uh, near extremal black holes, they're not all behaving in the same way. Like it's, there are different universality classes. And for me, the evidence, well, besides like saying, well, there, there's many reasons, but one of the reasons that for me, from a holographic point of view was quite interesting in understanding what are these differences, they were captured actually by the logarithmic corrections. Um, so uh, these, these papers, so this first one that I'm citing, that I'm putting here, it's a paper by uh, Ashok Sen, where he computed uh, the logarithmic corrections at, uh, for the Schwarzschild solution and some other non-extremal solutions. But even in this set of um, papers that were not accommodated necessarily for this discussion of JT, uh, there were patterns, there were very interesting patterns in this logarithmic corrections. 
And uh, they're already indicating that even if the, the way that you would try to account for this microscopically and what would be the different ingredients that you need are not uh, all on the same uh, footing. And I'm highlighting this last two papers that involve uh, Luca and Joaquin and some other collaborators because these papers are about uh, log corrections near extremality, uh, taking into account all these uh, new developments. And, and these papers are also illustrating that, uh, for instance, the role of supersymmetry is quite important. Okay, so how do you understand uh, basically the microscopics and the nature of the extremal entropy uh, in, in this case? And then last, just, uh, I always think super radiance is super interesting. <laughs> um, right now, in, in the context of this discussion, and what is the role of uh, these deformations? Because usually, the, in many cases, uh, it depends a bit on the shape of the black hole and details, but it tends to be that the ergosphere is a bit outside of the near horizon geometry. It's not quite uh, in it. it. It depends on the, on, on the black hole. But I am kind of curious uh, how to think about this yeah, uh, super radiance and stabilities in, in this language and, and how would I describe it in terms of like the interactions that the fields might have and like what does it mean for, for something to, to have the super radiant mode. But for that you need to understand basically how do you go from like physics that is happening here in the throat and exploring outside uh, as you start touching a pump. Up upon this ergosphere. And my, if you ask me what is my guess, I think there's a role of boundary conditions that is uh, having some play. And I'm just mentioning this very, very recent paper because Wei and Boyang were involved in this paper. They don't talk about super radiance, but uh, they do discuss uh, the role of boundary conditions. Um, and I have the feeling that it's it will be in, in that right direction for reasons that I can comment on uh, offline. In any case, I'm done. I'm done now, so thank you. Thank you very much, Alejandra. Let's uh, unmute. And... Questions? So maybe I had a question about the super radiance and the, the ergo region. So how should I expect this, uh, the, the JT physics to, to describe this, the ergo region? Does it, do you think it knows about it by okay, coupling to, to these I, other tower of scalars that you, other tower of fields yeah, you have? Or? That's my guess is that it knows about it from there, but I'm not absolutely sure because it's been complicated. Uh, mm -hmm. It might be that it's not as, like, because the, the thing about the, the ergo region also, yeah, it depends on the day that you ask me and how I feel, but one day I'm going to, like, I don't know, I will come back when, like, someone will figure it out. If it's, it's I'm sure, like, th this is not going to become unsolved, but sorry, I'm looking for where I write down the decoupling. So, uh, and this is this is why I was talking also a bit about boundary conditions, uh, because the appearance, it again, it depends a bit on the details of the black hole. But uh, the reason why sometimes the 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 ergosphere kind of like you can't see that you have something super radiant uh, from the point of view of the near horizon is because you're shifting phi and t. Mm -hmm. So the way that you measure energies in the near horizon is different from how you measure energies in the, in the far region. And right. so, and this is what you would have called, like this is the gauge field from in this line, in this jargon of like 2D gravity. And like, it means that you have some gauge field floating around. That, that's what the shift basically means. It's you're doing like some large gauge transformation to make the limit uh, finite. Right. And, and so you have to understand what is the role of these large gauge transformations and the gluing and why would that trigger like the, the shifting, uh, like if, if that's kind of reflected in some interaction or just some re reorganization, like, mm -hmm. uh, like 
Yeah. So. Is that basically I, I, this this Zamo this uh, zero angular momentum observer that uh, that yeah. you see, uh, right? Yeah. But there's a mismatch basically on like what it means to have like zero angular momentum if you're sitting here versus like sitting. I see. Yeah. Yeah. I see. So. So that, that's why I was advocating to boundary conditions, because I think it's something about how do you treat certain type of transformations. Um, and that might affect the interactions themselves, because it's what you describe as physical versus not physical, like if you want to have something or not. So, um, but uh, besides that, I, yeah, I, I think in this 5D example, we're trying to, this is one of our yeah, I, I hope I have something interesting to say in 5D, but um, in, in general, I think uh, in, in care, it might work differently. I, I'm not sure if this is going to be like, that, that's why I think it's interesting to, I kind of mention it because uh, I, I don't know what to. In 5D, you mean a rotating black hole in 5D? Or? Yeah. Yeah. And that's simpler somehow to, to study. Yeah, these black holes, they have the feature that, um, so it's just the reason why these black holes are more tractable and they're under much more control. It's because uh, these guys over here, so the sphere, the S3 is SO4. And so you can think of it as basically two copies of SU2. And of course you can, so you can have like two rotational parameters but there's a way how you can add rotation such that you just break this one down to a U1. Oh, uh, I see. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so then you preserve a whole SU2 and that's nice because then it gives us a lot of control. So you can add the rotation, but without like destroying fully the symmetries. Um, and so mm -hmm. it, it, it gives us like a, a way how to like write down some part of the spectrum in a consistent truncation and like understand yeah, the similarities of the problem and stuff and like and so you have the whole interpolation like uh, from the UV to to the IR um, but in, in care like it's just it's yeah um, it's more complicated yeah and then the BTC is too simple because uh well and there's no super radius in BTC so yeah exactly yeah uh -huh. um, so then I can't ask the question in that model but I some people okay. disagree with me though, and they do say, <laughs> they do think that there, there's a sense in which if you if you do things in a funny way, you can make BTC super radio. But I don't know if that's that. Okay, well, no, no. maybe we don't want to we'll do funny recorded. things. I can't say anything. <laughs> Thanks. Um, there's another question. Uh, Fabio raised his hand. You can just unmute yourself, Fabio. Uh, hi, uh, thanks Alejandra for the very nice talk. So I was wondering if this deformed metric, what's the asymptotic symmetry group of this metric? Is the same as in CARE CFT? Uh, for sure not. Uh, in CARE CFT, um, let me see where the closest line element um, is. Uh, the boundary conditions are definitely so. No, um, yeah, uh, they're not, it's, well, we don't, in this context, we're not describing it that much in terms of asymptotic uh, symmetry group, uh, because uh, some of these perturbations are actually uh, dynamical, but uh, from the point of view of care CFT, their deformorphisms were uh, Reparametrizations. So you, you have this direction here, the U1. So you have an SL2 times U1 uh, set of killing vectors. And in CARE CFT, they basically looked at reparametrizations of phi. Uh, and that, that those reparametrizations of the angle phi get, got enhanced to a Vera Soro. And the central charges that they compute are basically sitting here on this side. If you want the, the reparametrizations and like the Schwarzschild mode that shows up in the context of JT gravity are reparametrizations of time. So they're broken, they're symmetries that are broken. So it's not, it, that's why like one has to be careful uh, with the terminology, but at the level like 
even before you add the deformations, um, the, the set of deformorphisms that are uh, accounting for all of these effects are time reparametrizations of this boundary of ADS2. And so it's, it's affecting the SSL2 part. And CARE CFT did not touch that. All of the diffeomorphism, uh, the asymptotic symmetry group of CARE CFT, did not have any like sort of role on that, um, on, on that part of it. OK, thank you. Any more questions for Alejandra? If not, let's thank Alejandra again uh, for a wonderful talk. Thank you. I'll stop sharing my screen. <laughs>